In this morning's epistle reading, the Apostle Paul instructs the Ephesians to be imitators of God, walking in love. I cannot think of a more perfect theme for our choir pilgrimage and companions tour to Durham Cathedral. I'll get back to the epistle reading eventually, but I'll start with a quick review of the past few weeks. Our choir just returned from a week of spiritual pilgrimage, taking part in the worship life of Durham Cathedral in the northeast of England by singing choral evensong every day and the Eucharist last Sunday morning. And the music that the choir is singing this morning, the setting of the mass and the offertory anthem are the same pieces that we sang for the Eucharist last Sunday at Durham Cathedral. Everyone at the cathedral was so supportive and appreciative and some of the compliments that we received on our singing, we will remember for the rest of our lives. The clergy of the cathedral prayed for St. Paul's Chattanooga every day at services, and the dean of Durham asked if St. Paul's would pray for the mission and ministry of Durham Cathedral as well. A lot of choir members have posted about the trip on social media, and a common phrase in their posts was life-changing. Durham Cathedral is a special, holy place, and you can sense that as soon as you walk in, or even before that, as you glimpse the towers on the horizon. What makes it most special, and unlike any other cathedral, is that it was built as a burial place and a shrine for St. Cuthbert. Before the trip, we all had varying degrees of familiarity with the history of English Christianity and how that history is relevant to us as American Episcopalians. A month or two, I wrote the choir an email entitled something like, Who is St. Cuthbert and why should we care? It is hard to express how beloved Cuthbert, a man who lived nearly 1,400 years ago, still is to the north of England. So now our choir knows the story of St. Cuthbert so well that I'm happy to be fact-checked by anybody. Um, As I I wrote this sermon on on an airplane without any access to to reference materials, so um, if I get dates or anything wrong, just let me know. Um, The reason that Cuthbert was so beloved in his lifetime and in the centuries after his death is because he embodied what the Apostle Paul was talking about in today's epistle reading. Paul is telling the Ephesians specifically how to walk in love as members of a Christian community. Cuthbert started his life as a novice of the Benedictine Priory on Lindisfarne under the rule of the Prior St. Aidan. We spent all of Thursday, August 1st, on Lindisfarne, or Holy Island. Father Murdoch celebrated the Holy Eucharist for us at the Church of St. Mary the Virgin, just steps from the Priory ruins where Christians have been worshiping for 1,400 years. The service, continued, or the service concluded with a prayer of St. Aidan. Lord, this bare island, make it thy place of peace. Here be the peace of those who do thy will. Here be the peace of brothers serving men. Here be the peace of holy rules obeying. Here be the peace of praise by dark and day. Be this thy island, thy holy island. I, thy servant Aidan, make this prayer. Be it thy care. Amen. So Cuthbert grew up learning from Aidan and the other monks how to be an imitator of God according to the rule of Benedict. It is no surprise that Cuthbert later became the prior of the monastery because this is how he was described by the church historian, the Venerable Bede, who was also buried in Durham Cathedral. Bede writes, Cuthbert had such a light in his angelic face and such a love for proclaiming his message. He protected the people entrusted to him by his constant prayer and inspired them to heavenly things by his salutary teachings. He was a fire with heavenly love, unassumingly patient, devoted to unceasing prayer and kindly to all who came to him for comfort. Everybody loved Cuthbert because the light of God shone through him. He was also a hero to introverts, such as myself and a fair few of our choir members. After serving as prior, he further devoted himself to prayer by becoming a hermit and living on a tiny island about 100 yards from the sea, from the priory. This was my favorite place on Holy Island. Looking across, imagining him praying with the puffins and the seals and the otters to keep him company. 
But even from there, he would teach and heal and serve and be an imitator of Christ Jesus. Very reluctantly, but at the request of everyone, he left his little island to become a bishop and served as a bishop until his death. One of our tour guides told us that even while Cuthbert was alive, everyone knew he was going to be considered a saint by the church upon his death. So 10 years after he was buried, the monks dug up his body, as was the custom for saints, to wash his bones and collect relics to distribute. But to their surprise, they found his body incorrupt, as if he were asleep, as Bede says. Sometime later, the monks got wind of Viking raids nearby and they dug up Cuthbert again to keep his tomb from being desecrated. Now, I'm compressing hundreds of years of history here, so ask a choir member or someone who went on the Companions Tour for the full story, but for hundreds of years, a small group of monks carried Cuthbert's body around from place to place to try to keep it safe. They eventually ended up in Durham. And round about this time was when the Normans invaded England from France. And they were not like the Vikings. Um, they, were, um, they were Roman Catholic. And partly to gain the favor of their new subjects in the north of England, and partly to showcase their power and wealth, they, bought, they built the humble hermit Cuthbert, a magnificent shrine, which was Durham Cathedral. And the community of monks that had borne Cuthbert all around Northumbria had a new home and a place of worship. Cuthbert's tomb and shrine survived the Reformation. Henry VIII's armies and the dis dissolution of the monasteries, and that is a, another story um, that I will skip, um, but Cuthbert's body remains in a tomb behind the high altar about 50 yards from where we sang all week. What was so moving to me was that the heartbeat of, of Cuthbert's life as a monk, and then as a hermit, and then as a bishop, was daily prayer, the daily offices, and that his community kept offering those prayers as they carted him around after his death, and that the stones of Durham Cathedral have echoed for nearly a thousand years with the voice of prayer and praise in the daily office, and that we, from St. Paul's Chattanooga, had the immense privilege of offering those same prayers in the communion of Cuthbert, Bede, Oswald, and indeed all the saints. We won't forget St. Oswald. Um, his, um, as the choir will tell you, his, um, his head is buried in Cuthbert's tomb. Um, that is another story. <laughs> but what, what I hope to take back from our experience and what I hope our choir and companions take back is the experience of offering prayers every day and the nearness of the communion of saints in all places. No, Cuthbert is not buried behind the altar here, but when we gather in this place, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, saints in every generation in whom God is glorified. In the words of one of my favorite hymns, which sadly is not in our hymnal, these stones that have echoed their praises are holy, these stones, these bricks, and dear is the ground where their feet hath once trod, Yet still they confess they were strangers and pilgrims, and still they were seeking the city of God. I'm sure we can all think of saints in this place in whom God is glorified, and the plaques on the walls and in the memorial garden remind us. Our history at St. Paul's is slightly shorter, but the communion of all the saints is the same. In case I don't get another opportunity to say it, I am deeply grateful for this holy place and for all the holy people who have been the body of Christ to me and my family for these past six years. Returning to today's readings, a common thread and a theme that marks the lives of saints, those who are imitators of God, is sacrifice. The epistle reading closes with words that are very familiar to us as Episcopalians from one of the offertory sentences in the Book of Common Prayer. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And then in the gospel reading, Jesus says, the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. In his life and in, in his death, Jesus' way of walking in love was sacrifice. Only he could die 
and take away the sin of the world and give his flesh for, as bread for the life of the world, the bread that has sustained us and all the saints and that we are about to receive in the Holy Eucharist, God in Christ Jesus made that sacrifice for us on the cross. Only he could do that, and that is not the sacrifice that we are called to. But the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, does call us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. And we have the lives of saints to inspire us in that calling. If Cuthbert had followed the devices and desires of his own heart, perhaps he would have been the kind of hermit who cries solitude to the point of ignoring the needs of others. He was still a hermit, but one whose life was so marked with acts of love and sacrifice that everyone could see the light of God shining through him. When we sing as a choir, we present our hearts, minds, souls, and bodies to God as a living sacrifice that God may use them for his service through music in praise and thanksgiving. Our pilgrimage to Durham has certainly renewed that calling in me, and I can sense that it has in others in the choir as well. We are all called to walk in love, giving of ourselves according to the gifts God has given us. Our choir ends every choir rehearsal with the chorister's prayer, which reminds us of this mission. Choir, you are invited to pray it along with me. Bless, O Lord, us thy servants, who minister in thy temple. Grant that what we sing with our lips, we may believe in our hearts, and what we believe in our hearts, we may show forth in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.